Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Who wants to be set free this morning by the truth? Who wants to be released? If the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. That's what, why we teach the word, so that we be free, not just so we have a good intellectual exercise, but that we be free from fear, we be free from negative behaviours, free from sickness, free from disease, free from poverty, free from the things that Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. We want to be set free. I'm going to get you cranked up this morning. <laughs> you want to be set free? Yes. Amen. Amen. So there was this man... <laughs> Um, are we all right at the back? Yeah? There was this bloke, we'll call him Fred, and uh, he was very, very into, excited about, loved thinking about agricultural machinery. He loved combine harvesters, tractors, ploughs, all those kind of implements, farm implements, and he's, as he grew up, you know, all his bedroom poster, whereas other people would have pop stars and that, he'd have a Massey Ferguson or a John Deere or something like that posted on his, and as he grew older and older, of course, this uh, made him a little bit isolated <laughs> from the general populace, and uh, one day he thought to himself, this is it, this is, this is not going to work. I'm not going to be very popular with people and I'm not going to get a girlfriend if I keep going on about tractors and combine harvesters and stuff like that. So one day he made a, a vow to himself and he, he packed all his books and his posters and everything away, put it all in a box, shoved it out of the way and he said, I'm not, I can't do that anymore. It's not making me socially acceptable. And he went out into the big wide world looking for a girlfriend. And he met Doris. Doris and Fred started going out, started courting. And one day Doris said to Fred, oh, you know, I've got, there's a party. Some of my friends are having a party. You ought to come along. I know you're not used to going to parties. But uh, come to this party and we'll you know, we like, we enjoy ourselves. So they go to this party and they're in a big crowded room full of people who've ever been in a party and this is a time or a place where people would smoke as well so there's a lot of smoke in the room and it was very stifling and smoky and stuffy and your eyes were watering and there was Fred and Doris and they got separated in the room and Doris was mixing with her friends and Fred was sort of feeling a bit isolated there and in the end she come over to him and she said oh all this smoke getting in my eyes, can't, that's a song, isn't it? Can't, can't cope with this anyway. She said, can't you, could you do something, Fred, help me like this? So Fred thought, okay. So he walked to the centre of the room, pushed his way through all these cr crowds of people that he didn't know, stood in the middle of the room and took a huge, great deep breath. <laughs> and all the smoke in the room cleared and went into him. And she come running, Doris come running, oh, you're, you're my hero, you're my hero, look, everyone's happy now, the smoke's gone. And they come rushing over to him, oh, Fred, Fred, how did you do it, how did you do it? And he said, well, I confess, I'm an ex-Tractor fan. <laughs> oh, dear. Have you ever been in a crowded room? Have you ever been in a crowded room, a party or anything like that, and you felt alone? Has anyone had that experience? Loads of people, big social atmosphere, and yet you felt alone. Anyone? Yeah, the hands are going up, yeah. It's an experience we've all had, isn't it? We've been in a, an environment where we feel alone, and yet there seems to be, physically we can see we're not alone yet we feel alone. Because emotions and feelings are a strange thing, aren't they? And they can steer our life in one way or another. And what we can perceive something, and yet our emotions will tell us something else. Our emotions will say, you're alone, you feel lonely. And it's 
it seems it's common to a lots of people. I know I've experienced it. And it happens all the time, different situations. Have you ever been in a meeting, a, a church meeting or a healing meeting or any Christian meeting, and people are happy, joyful, laughing in the spirit, being slain, doing all sorts of weird things, or just being generally happy, and you felt, oh, I'm not getting that. You felt alone. Have you ever had that? Been in that environment, and you think, I'm not getting what they get. Because emotions are a strange thing, aren't they? They make you feel things when you think, when you can see everything's happening really well and yet your emotions tell you something different. And there's been a, certainly when I was growing up as a Christian, my younger days, and I don't know whether you've been across this or not, so if I'm preaching to the converted, I apologise, but there's been these theories and teachings that I've come across where it's like the Holy Spirit comes and goes, comes and goes, and your feelings come and go. And so we link the Holy Spirit coming and going with our feelings coming and going. And we end up on this roller coaster ride, thinking that the Spirit is moving in and then moving out, and moving in and moving out. Has anyone been through that experience, that teaching? And there's another teaching which I was taught when I was a young Christian, which some of you may be taught, so I'm going to kill a few sacred cows this morning, hopefully. Um, this popular belief, and if I offend anyone, I don't apologise, <laughs> that we, we are, I think the, the picture was we were like a tin can, I think, and we had all holes in us and we were like a leaky can. Has anyone come across that theology? And God would pour the spirit into us and then it would all come springing out the holes. Has no one come across that? Yeah? Has anyone been taught that? I can't find it in the Bible, to be honest, but that, that was the, the theory. And then so what you had to do is you had to keep getting topped up because it would just kept flooding out the holes all the time and you know people would have sermons where they'd have visual aids of leaky cans and things like that. And I have some visual aids this morning, but no leaky cans. Because I, I did have a look, and I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says we're leaky cans. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to scrap that one for a start. So let's, let's just go back to what Jesus said in John 14. You're going to like this. Jesus said... I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor. Who's the other counsellor? The Holy Spirit, yes. To be with you forever. forever. Woohoo! <laughs> He's forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So how do we get to this theology of the Spirit moving in and out when he says, he'll be with you forever! Woohoo! <laughs> and when I thought about that, that's really exciting, isn't it? He's with me forever. Not because of anything I've done, but because Jesus promised he was going to come. Thank you, Eliana. So I was really excited about this. The Holy Spirit is with me forever. And yet we've got this theology going around the church saying, you know, we've got to cry out for the Holy Spirit. You know, I've been to meetings, you know, send your Holy Spirit, Lord, send your Holy Spirit. Stuff like that. And I think, well, didn't Jesus say he was there already? What, you know, which is it? Now, I'm not against, I must just say, I'm not against meetings where, you know, spirit, you see the spirit move and people are affected by the spirit and some great things happen. I love it when people laugh in the spirit. It's hilarious. <laughs> great things like that. 
But it's not, have you ever noticed that the Spirit only moves in meetings where people are, where Christians are? Because that's where the Spirit is, isn't he? He's in us forever. Woo-hoo. So if you can take nothing away this morning, get rid of this idea that your emotions are telling you whether the Spirit is with you or not. Because the truth is, he's with you forever. And it's nothing to do with your emotions. And you know you can stand in a crowded room and feel like you're alone, but you're not alone. So it's just the same with the Spirit. Your emotions can tell you something. And that's what the devil loves to do, to convince you that you haven't got the Spirit today. You're not quite there, not quite ready. So, God fills us with the Holy Spirit and you need to be baptised and filled and receive the Holy Spirit as a Christian, don't you? To have his power in you. And in Ephesians chapter 1, which is our next scripture, it says you, and we'll class that as us, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which is what we've heard. Having believed, which we did, you were marked in him with a seal. What was the seal? The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those whose God's possession to the praise of his glory. One thing about a deposit, if I put a deposit on a car, what happens to that deposit? It stays there, doesn't it? It never comes back. So a deposit never changes, always stays. But I want you to notice that we're marked with a seal. And when God puts his Holy Spirit in us, he puts it in us, our spirit. And Paul's done a lot of teaching on spirit, soul and body. But our spirits become alive to God when we're born again. And when he puts his Holy Spirit in us, he puts his Holy Spirit joined with our spirit in our inner man or in our inner woman. And it's like, I've got a jar of lemon curd here, (laughs) because that's all I had in the cupboard this morning. But it's like a vacuum seal. (laughs) When you seal something in, it's sealed, it's locked, can't come out. The seal is there, only God's seal is obviously a little bit better than a jar of lemon curd. But the Spirit of God is sealed in us. That's what it says, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. That's brilliant, isn't it? So not only have we got the Holy Spirit forever, he's sealed inside us. So nobody can get him out. Nobody can pull him out or suck him out because he's sealed in. Amen? So don't listen to your emotions. Don't listen to your feelings when you think, oh, I haven't got the Holy Spirit today. Because he's sealed inside. Fantastic. Now, I'd like to say that that was the end of the story because we'd all be happy like me. But we're not all happy like me all the time, are we? Because I'm not happy all the time. Our emotions go up and down, don't they? And our soulish part of us is the part that we are used to in the past directing our lives. Our soul and our thoughts and our words are the things that have been directing our lives before we were Christians and unfortunately for a lot of us since we've been Christians because we just carry on in the same vein. We don't listen to the spirit, we just carry on listening to our emotions, listening to our thoughts and so the devil can pop in and give you a negative thought about something and because your soul is running your life it can accept it whereas if your spirit is running your life you don't accept it so one of the big reasons why this theology had come about I think in the church about being filled with the Holy Spirit then it leaking out and then you're being filled and then it leaking out so then you'd have to go to a really important meeting 
and get filled up again, especially if the guy at the front was a particularly spiritual person, you'd get filled up a bit more and you'd have to go to that meeting over there because that was a better one, or you'd have to go down the road, you know, and it just went on and on. And one of the reasons that this theology came about, I think, is because, and some of you might already be one step ahead of me thinking, ah, Brian, but what about Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18? I can see you're all thinking that. <laughs> so we do have Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, and this is, the, this is the little bad boy that gives us all the trouble, I think. Because it says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And you can ask me afterwards what debauchery means. <laughs> It says, instead, be filled with the Spirit. And all the Greek scholars stand up and say, yes, and it's in the present continuous tense. So therefore, we have to go on being filled with the Spirit all the time. So the only logical conclusion is we've got holes in us and it keeps leaking out again. Well, no, that's not the only logical conclusion, but that's where the church, where I was taught to go so that... What was sealed inside me, what Jesus said was forever with me, the Holy Spirit would somehow keep escaping, keep running off, going somewhere else when I needed him. So what does this mean? Well, if we look at the next verse, it says, Do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery, instead be filled with the Spirit. And it says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think to a certain degree we understand that by singing and praising and declaring truth and speaking out, we understand that we are kind of affecting our souls, we're allowing the spirit to move through our souls and out of our words as we learn our words take our thoughts captive and we understand that by singing truth, by understanding praise, we allow what's in our spirits to come up into our souls and I think there's a key there as to how we carry on being filled with the spirit. Just as a, by the, on a personal note, I don't know about you, but I, I used to be a very religious person, very religious. And, uh, you know, if somebody gave me something to do, like confessing my sins, oh, I would, I would have to be religious about it. Because oh, I thought, well, if I missed out one day, that was it, I was in trouble. <laughs> so, you know, I'd always, before I went to bed at night, you know, I'd always make sure I confessed my sins. And if I hadn't done it, you know, I was, I was, in panic mode. And it was the same with, not again, I don't want to offend anyone here, but putting on the armour as well, you know. It was always, oh, I forgot to put the armour on today, oh no, what's going to happen to me? <laughs> and then the other one was being filled with the Spirit. You know, it's been two days and I didn't ask God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I must have leaked out so much. <laughs> <laughs> Did nobody ever go through it? I must have had a weird Christian upbringing. <laughs> I was so religious, I was just, I had a stack of things I had to do every night to make sure that I was all right with God. Um, yeah, anyway, that was by the by. <laughs> so we've got this, uh, you know, a lot of people have used this, the, the bit afterwards um, regarding being filled with the Holy Spirit, but it's never kind of satisfied me enough to understand what this means, and because of that, kind of religious background, I suppose, that, that those thoughts were in my head. I wanted to be set free. I don't, I don't want to just change my thinking to some other regulation. I want to be set free. I want to be released because Jesus came to set me free. His Holy Spirit is in me. So there, there's got to be something here that's setting me free, really. That's what I want. And I think there's two, two keys to this. Uh, and the next, if you go back, go to the next verse... I think it should be, yes. See, this is where people don't look. Um, but actually, if you look in context, and it's like a sandwich. I've sort of found it's a sandwich. Because if you go back to the verse before, rather than the verse afterwards, it says, therefore, do not be foolish. Now, the Bible's quite clear. Foolish people 
are people that hear the word of God and then just don't do anything about it. Come to church every week, listen, yeah, that's good. Go away, don't do anything. That's what Jesus said is foolish, isn't it? So just turn to your neighbour and say, I ain't no fool. <laughs> Unfoolish, what's the opposite to foolish? Clever? No. Wise. Wise people, the wise man built his house upon the rock, that's right. Wise people, they understand what the Lord's will is. And how do we understand what the Lord's will is? I'm looking for my Bible. We, we have to pick up our word, don't we? We have to listen. We, we listen to teaching every week. We, we hear Paul and Nick preaching and we understand, but we, we read this, we go to house group and we understand. And then we're wise, aren't we? We're not foolish anymore. And then it goes on. As soon as he said that, he then says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. So that I think there's a key there of understanding what the Lord's will is. And this again is, a, is our soul, because this is affecting our thinking, the way we think and the way we believe. So this all, let's try and tie this up then, because the other thing about this scripture which makes me giggle a bit, because if you're, if you're very legalistic about this scripture, it says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And there are some schools of thinking, you know, religious people that will say, well, this, this is a scripture that tells you not to get drunk. Don't get near the evil liquor. Well, no, it's not. Paul, I'm sure Paul wouldn't have wasted his time explaining to people the ba how bad it is to get drunk because we all know that, don't we? And people out in the world, non-Christians, know the evils of liquor. We, we, you know, that's just obvious, isn't it? So he's not using this scripture to explain why a Christian shouldn't get drunk. Now, again, before I go any further, I'm just I'm saying, no, I'm not encouraging people to get drunk. <laughs> but the point is, that's not why Paul used this, I don't believe. And the reason Paul uses this picture of getting drunk is, well, hands up, come on in, be honest. Who's ever got drunk? No. Oh, all the elders have put their hands up. No. <laughs> As quite a lot of people got drunk, we've all done it at some time, haven't we? Some, some worse than others. How, how many people just got tipsy, a little bit tipsy on a bit of, yeah? A bit of cider. A bit of cider. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, but, right, let's think about this. What happens when you get drunk? The first thing that happens when you get drunk, when you put the spirit in you, is you start changing the way you think. Now, this is one of the reasons why they don't want people driving cars when they've been drinking. Because as soon as you have a bit of drink, your confidence levels start to go up. You start to think, I can do that, I can get through that gap with my car now, I can, I can just overtake him. And it's true, it's a scientific fact. Your thinking changes. So the first thing that happens when you're drinking is your thinking starts to change. Can you see where I'm going with this? What's the second thing that happens? You start to say stupid things when you're drunk, don't you? I love you. <laughs> Come on, guys. I'm looking at you blokes now. Hands up who's ever had a couple of drinks because you wanted to get your confidence up because you wanted to ask the babe out. Come on. You want it, and you wouldn't have said it without the drink, would you? You wouldn't have said, can I dance with you, please? <laughs> you wouldn't have done, would you? Because you, you had a bit of drink. So first of all, your belief changes. You think, oh, yeah, I could go for a year. And then your words change, and you've got the confidence to go and say to someone, well, would you like a dance? You see, the spirit changes your thinking, changes the words. And then ultimately... What does, what's the last thing that gets affected if you keep drinking? Your legs. Your body, isn't it? Your, your whole physical body starts getting, you know, really bad. You can't even stand up, can you? And so when we get filled, when we continue to be filled with the Spirit, when we understand what the Lord's will is, our belief 
changes. We allow the Spirit to change our beliefs. Then we allow the Spirit, he comes and he changes our words and the way we talk because we believe differently. And this is the Spirit moving into our soul, moving into the area that was dominant in our lives, but now he's coming in to help us. So it changes our thinking, our belief, as we understand, we read scripture, we not just read it, but understand it, as we know what the will of God is for us, it changes our soul and he moves in to our soul. I don't know how you want to think about that, if you need to picture it. With me, I find it easier to think of, because the Holy Spirit is not, uh, you know, not a liquid force, he's a person, and I kind of imagine my soul is like a big house, or I like to picture it as if anyone's ever been to the uh, Natural History Museum in London. Lovely building. I love running around there. But you go into a big hall, and it's like the Holy Spirit comes in. But then you invite it, then he starts to go into all the other rooms. He starts to go into your soulish life. He goes into your thinking room. He goes into the, the room that was uh, had a fear about something and he starts to invade as you allow him as you understand what the will of God is he starts to move in your soul Woohoo! <laughs> so that means you can go on being filled with the Holy Spirit so I don't think go on being filled with the Holy Spirit just means wait till the next meeting wait till the next time somebody prays for you because if we really want to go for continuous Greek tense then it's all the time and all the time we're understanding, all the time the Holy Spirit is invading what we think, what we believe, all the time the Holy Spirit is moving our talking, our Amorite voices out, and our good talking to the obedience of Christ in, is changing what's going on. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> Amen? You are starting to get a little bit excited. <laughs> this is fantastic, and the the amazing thing about this is it's only available to people that preach. <laughs> so you laugh. It's not, is it? It's a, the Holy Spirit Jesus gave each and every one of us. He said in the New Covenant, no longer will people say to one another, oh, know the Lord, know the Lord, because you will know the Lord. You will have the Holy Spirit. You've got as much Holy Spirit as I have, and we've got as much Holy Spirit as the Apostle Peter had, or... Paul or Kenneth Hagen or Andrew Womack. Same spirit, same person, sealed in. You can't, you can't change it because we've been sealed. It's the same Holy Spirit. Isn't that fantastic? So for me, I'm allowing my, my thought process to change. I'm allowing the Holy Spirit into my soul. He's filling me day by day by day, changing the way I believe and the way I think. But what would happen because you remember we looked at getting drunk, didn't we? This is the first sermon you've ever heard on getting drunk, isn't it? <laughs> it changes your thinking, changes your talking. What was the third thing? Your body. What would happen? What would happen if you just carried on being filled with the Holy Spirit and you let the Holy Spirit into the body realm, into the next realm? If he started moving, what, what would happen? Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul had this sussed because in Romans 8, I think it's the next, he says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, so I presume that was the Holy Spirit, is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead, what? Will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So when the Spirit is gushing through your soul, he's coming into your body, he's giving life. That means health, wholeness, well-being in your physical, this is talking about physical bodies now. That's what happens when you be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of people in the church nowadays, and, and rightly so, you know, saying we want to see healing in the churches, we want to see healing. But God doesn't want to see healing, because he doesn't want to see sickness. If you're going to have healing, you've got to have sickness. What God really wants is life for our mortal bodies. He wants the spirit to just 
invade our bodies and then we just have life through his spirit in us. I'm not against healing, we should have healing. But let's just believe for what God has given us, this wonderful gift. I think Fran in the worship mentioned about stirring what was in us up. It's down to us. It says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's an imperative, a Greek imperative. It's not, um, you know, it's not waiting for God to do something. It's not, oh God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. He's given us the command, be filled, go on, drink. And what does Jesus say? John 7, 38, which is not on the screen. Jesus said, whoever believes in me where would the spirit come from? Out of his belly, out of his innermost being, would flow the spirit. The spirit's coming out of your spirit, into your soul, and into your body. And isn't that wonderful? That's appropriate for all of us. If we can just grab hold of that and start being filled and being filled and being filled, understand what the Lord's will is for us. Take it on board, receive it, build with it. Don't be a fool. And finally, just going back to our, the picture of the lemon curd or the jam jar, as we're sealed in our spirits, and obviously he can affect our souls and our bodies. I shared this once before, but going back to our emotions, sometimes the spirit just ends up staying in our spirits because the devil has a very crafty way of affecting our emotions and stopping us believing that the spirit can come and affect our souls. And if he can keep our emotions in check, if you try and fight the devil in a realm of emotions, you're gonna lose. If you go back to faith, if you go back to the spirit, tell him the truth, there's nothing he can do. But what he'll do, and if you can hear this, when the seal is broken on a jam jar, you get this little popping sound. And what the devil likes to do is come along he can't actually do that, but he can make the sound. And he can make you think the seal is broken. He can make you think the spirit is gone. But it's not, because God said, I've sealed you. In. Done. As the chef would say. So don't let the devil pop your top. Don't let the devil convince you that your emotions are telling you the truth. Believe the word of God. Be filled, be filled, be filled, be filled, be filled, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit, soul and body. Drink. Amen? Amen. I'm looking at... Are we... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I just encourage you really Take that way. Don't be foolish. <laughs> be wise. Build on that. If you understand what the Lord's will is, if you take in scripture, if you receive that teaching, you will be filled. You'll continue to be filled. And ultimately, we will have right thinking, right talking, and life for our mortal bodies. Amen.